Hey guys, what's going on? Uh, miss all of you like that, so I miss teaching. I don't know if you miss school as much, uh, so I understandably so, uh, but hopefully that you're okay. Hopefully that everybody uh, is safe. Hopefully your family is okay. Uh, more worried about the economics of families and people almost as much as maybe if they come down with the COVID or something of that nature and suffer through it because I think people are are losing some jobs, some hours, uh, so that could definitely impact you know people across the country and the world as it already is doing right now. So I know it's cool to say that like you know all the the boomers and you know and all the people old people and people are just going like you know again going crazy going too far they're all like scared i know that's a cool thing to say and that everybody wants to be you know calm cool and collected and somebody else is freaking out over toilet paper or paper towels or whatever necessities uh there is uh, like Mr. Price going after his double stuffed Oreos, like that, say, take that lady, like that, you know? So, uh, but uh, it is something that is, you know, historical and exceptional. Definitely in my lifetime, obviously in your lifetime. Stay positive, stay cool, uh, you know, and just kind of put it in perspective that, you know, something to tell maybe your future family kids or whatever about what you live through. I'm optimistic. There are some smart people out there, uh, you know, even if they don't lead our government, that will be tr doing research, will be doing things here to kind of corral this and make sure that life gets back to normal, and, you know, eventually. Uh, you know, your school days, it's kind of, you know, it's, I know they say like up until March 27th, but let's be realistic. Who knows about the rest of this semester? Uh, thing is that you don't have to probably worry about that. A lot of people are going to wave the magic wand and says, hey, you know, it was, you know, the, you know, COVID-19 virus that was being spread around. So everybody gives you an asterisk and give you an exception. Who knows if we're going to take this A push test on May 8th or maybe when uh, they might make an adjustment and it's somewhat an abbreviated test or a postponed a test to a certain time. Who knows? All right, You might not be, a lot of things may be getting canceled, canceled or, or postponed uh, with that. Now that being said, you know, uh, oh, this is coming from my house because school is kind of off limits. Teachers are going there right now. I went I was uh, I got finished my work and my grading a little bit earlier, so I don't really have to pick up any personal items uh, from there, and so I, I'm okay with that. And this is my house. I know you're like Mr. Price. Why aren't you in my office? Well, because I don't know. See, this is all in my office are these ties, and there's no room. All right. And part of the reason why we'll be getting a bigger house just like any other greedy capitalist pig or Western, uh, you know, pecuniary kind of this, you know, um, uh, materialism and, you know, thing is, it's because our stuff, because most people move to bigger house because of the stuff that we accumulate and hoard to a certain degree. So that's what it is. So that's why I'm in the living room. Then you might hear some doggies now and then. So I'm not going to edit that out and everything. So I got three dogs up here. Uh, wifey is at her school trying to take care of some last minute business so I thought this would be a good time to record who knows if she'll let me like you know record other times like, hey they might be scoping out our house to get our toilet paper you know so who knows all right and you don't have to like this is not an assignment you're not required to listen or watch me uh, you know that's been bestowed from Mount Olympus of Wake County that, you know, as far as, you know, any type of assigned work that you're responsible for. Rest of the schools, as you know, are like really on their kind of official spring break anyway. So you got an extra week, two weeks, and probably even more in a way. What I said that I wanted to do, and I hopefully you guys, some of you will, 
I don't think a lot of you are. I mean, your brains are in vacation mode and it's staying in vacation mode. We'll at least tune in to some of the things I have to say so to kind of keep up with routine and assignments. I'm going to try my best to kind of keep up with routine for like post a video today, uh, try to keep it around 30 minutes, one on Thursday, and you know, keep on with our assignments. You're as far as what I would lecture about. You're not responsible for anything. You probably may have already shut me off. Or, you know, I'm pretty sure most people are not going to listen to my fat face and my voice and everything. Like you got like bigger concerns or things to do. I really wish you would just tell the, to the students that do tune in here. Just tell them that Mr. Price is just recommending that you don't forget about topics. Don't forget about certain things I'm saying on the surface level. Devoting maybe 10 to 15 minutes or more to looking at one or two notes, thinking or what you should be looking at, reading a paragraph. I, I just think it would just help you tremendously instead of just shutting it all down. Now your brain wants to shut it all down. Your brain is really uh, works very good and it understands pleasure, it understands joy, it understands laziness when you can so why you know push yourself to that moment but I'm really imploring you I'm just saying this out like please please you know uh, try to uh, definitely stay in some type of mode I didn't say devote a lot of time so anyway on that note I want to move on and uh, say those all those you know in you know formalities in here so uh, to, to say to you guys 1950s and I, and I just you know to harken back a couple of weeks ago major things and that's the thing is that you should always think about the 50s here that decade you got really at a time where people feeling you know prosperous and, and again it could be an illusion of prosperity like the 1920s there's gonna be a recession towards the end of the decade but we know that's how economics runs uh, usually always in cycle. All right, just right now, we're going to probably go through an economic decline, not so much a natural decline, but caused by outside interferences. And that may be war. It may be, you know, again, a calamity like the, you know, flu of 18, I mean, 1918, 1919, and this COVID virus spreading around the world. So those things really like throws the monkey wrench into Western capitalist economics and that's what happens but prosperity in the 50s consumerism let's buy some things there reason why we're able to you know really hoard up on a lot of stuff we have a lot of availability of consumer goods reason why the Russians who came to visit us was really amazed was our stores our shopping malls our choices consumerism is really kind of gets his really growth in the 1950s 1920s again start of it. You see this like buying on installment, buying on, you know, it's somewhat kind of a, a credit. And by the way, uh, first credit card by Bank of America is going to be issued in uh, the 1950s. Actually, I'm thinking this is a Diners Club card that's going to, you know, be the original Bank of America in the 1950s. So you get the credit. Sorry, ladies, you can't have credit cards because, you know, they would not allow that until like the 1970s. So this is still a very sexist racist America. I know everybody thinks they like don't why are people trying to denigrate that time? I'm just trying to show you a more realistic time than some people trying to idolize idealize, excuse me, you know, like there's some kind of golden age of sign. Usually when you peel back the onion, you kind of see some things here that just doesn't smell as good and it's not as great as people would like to think it is. Alright? Um Suburbanization, people moving outside, we saw that. Hopefully that maybe some of you are already seeing that video. Probably everybody's not going to probably take a look at it right now. Uh, to look at the video that you, you see about people moving into the suburbs and then when a black family was going to move into the suburbs uh, in there. And conformity, really kind of conformity, uniformity. You really, you see these developments move like around the towns, around Raleigh area that are very, as we nickname, like cookie cutter houses. Well, you really see that with Levittown, 
those houses, the landscaping is the same, the same bushes, the same trash cans. People actually almost in clockwork taking out the trash almost at the same time. Same cars that people are buying. People kind of noticing like, you know, what your, uh, your habits, when you're like, you know, your husband, what do they do? Uh, you know, what, what are you doing? Like, you know, again, like how many kids do you have? Who is that person? Just really kind of this conformist society. I don't know why, and, and I've said this before, peer pressure does not leave you after high school. It remains to you until you pass away, until you're dead. People will always be kind of worried about what are the neighbors, what are my family, what are people going to think at work about me if I act away or dress a certain way or you know do do certain things in here so I think I, I get I get some dogs passing along here I don't know if you'll be able to I just saw brownie in the background but anyway so that's what's happening there Sub suburbanization consumerism in here prosperity conformity and, and by the way just somebody notes that I'm going I'm kind of like taking my eye or looking at reminding me to make sure to go over I will like you know, either either on the Moodle or I'll probably like put it on a Google Doc that you want to edit or keep to yourself and everything and say because this actually is a good page about just one page or front and back on that guys now that gives you the whole gist of the 1950s for the most part and what a push is expecting so recap what we talked about the Thursday before you guys left for a break uh, in a way before the you know all the state and national emergencies was the Cold War part and, and the main thing about Eisenhower as far as Cold War I told you is the Eisenhower doctrine and he said that he would it's kind of two parts there massive retaliation him and John Foster Dulles his Secretary of State there's always a threat of nuclear weapons he even threatened the North Koreans that he probably would like, you know, use nuclear weapons, North Koreans and the Chinese, if they don't like capitulate, come to some kind of terms. So they did reach an armistice there. So you, so and the second part was a Suez crisis, and then you know on there, and then Suez crisis made Eisenhower kind of make a formal announcement and talking about these kind of doctrines, just like the going harking back to the Monroe Doctrine, the Roosevelt Corollary. Um, the Stinson Doctrine in the 1930s, it, there are no formal agreements, it's things that you say that the United States will practice. It set precedence. That's what it does for foreign policy. And he said that, look, in the Middle East, do add on to the Truman Doctrine. He specifically mentions an area that he will help free people of the world and that he will come to their aid and defense in the Middle East. He thought that he, you know, instead of just using nuclear weapons, CIA, which is kind of uh, evolved from the OSS in the 1940s there, they could use covert operations. Anybody who's like, you know, fighting communism to spy. So you have that with, you know, Iran, Indonesia, Guatemala, kind of overthrowing who the United States perceives as like communist sympathizers, you know, and they're going to wage that kind of espionage kind of war with the Soviet Union while, it, you know, in, during the Cold War. Fears are heightened in 1957 with the launch of Sputnik. Fear about people and they, you know, increase spending on national defense, creates NASA the following year because we're thinking that the U.S. is ahead in the you know technological race and in the space race and they can launch nuclear missiles to attack us and wipe us out uh, even the opponents of Eisenhower and Nixon are gonna say hey there's a missile gap and that's what John F. Kennedy is gonna say there is no real missile gap Soviet Union in reality is not ahead go back to 1957 you're in the United States you only have two channels at this time you know, CBS and NBC. ABC has not launched until, I think, the late 1950s, early 1960s. That 
you really can't believe only thing and you're kind of a more of a singular society of I always say just kind of mono pop culture or mono media so you think that you just you do listen to the news stories and what's in there you just not there's nothing on there's no internet to check it out or check another news source in there you read the newspaper and you read details and that's what people did some people just listen to what people said about after they read the news or called the news it's not repeated News is not repeated on television. You catch the 6 o'clock or the 5 o'clock news, and there is no late night television. There is no local newscast at 11 at this time. You believe what you hear for the most part, or it makes an impression upon you. Anyway, so you got that Cold War culture. You got people like, you know, still, it is not at the height of McCarthyism of, of, of the Red Scare. It's dialed down to about a 7 I would say on the Red Scare kind of uh, scale or the fear of like, you know, uh, nuclear war or maybe eight, you know, with Sputnik, it kind of dials back up and people are worried about nuclear annihilation and even Eisenhower too because he's thinking about that, you know, the world will be over so we need to negotiate, we need to get with Khrushchev who's not as a hardliner and a killer like Stalin. Very good. I, I, and, it, and it's all right. People like, you know, already turned me off. There's notes too as well. I understand. I, I just, you know, again, it just helps me, keeps me fresh, and maybe it might help one or two of you too as well. Just kind of listen to my, you know, gabby voice or whatever and hear, hear me uh, talking about things. This is different because you don't get the reaction from the class. I just got my dogs over here. One of them walking in the background. Bird chirping in the backyard. Not that just just really in an ironic way a lovely time as far as weather wise and just you know being able to relax and do a few things uh, around the house anyway on that note domestically Eisenhower he wanted to be liberal with pe with people all right but conservative with money as in regards to the federal government he was not a Calvin Coolidge he was not someone who says that I want to really reduce the federal government to nothing. He saw the practical purposes of that. This is called dynamic conservatism. You know, liberal people. He will increase, just like Truman, Social Security benefits. He will increase the minimum wage. He will create, you know, Department of Housing and, and Welfare, like again, so that, you know, that's under Ike's administration. He is by no means a liberal. He is the, by no means someone that, you know, who thinks that he wants to make, you know, social change and that he wants to end segregation, he wants to end lynching. Uh, there is going to be two civil rights commissions, um, really a lot of civil rights commissions, 1957, 1960, but they don't really have a lot of enforcement. There's a lot of meetings, a lot of, like, recommendations, but Eisenhower is not backing those things. He doesn't think that we should, the government should be in some kind of, like, social experiment in correcting people and, and correcting like how people live and their attitudes and changes. That's not the role of the government. That's Ike's. So he is definitely has his conservative credentials. You got Nixon there who's again against you know he's at, after the communists and Eisenhower does not want to be spending a lot of money on programs. Again, exception is 19 you know 57 with the Interstate Highway Act and you really have you know uh, billions of dollars and that has to deal with ev evacuations and security and Cold War but also to just really has helped us out today that we, we can get from one place to the other if we're allowed to <laughs> in these times or if we can, we can you know go from one place to the other uh, in, in there so the interstate highway I don't know so he is he again spending money but I want you to think that he's you know somebody who would be you know again not conservative at all but definitely we would have a challenging time in the modern, from the Reagan almost all the way up to the present kind of Republican Party for the most part, you know. Um, uh, he would definitely be strong on defense and there and people would see that. All right, good enough. So, and that's somewhat more mostly his domestic agenda. You can like see some other notes too from an answer right there. But the part I want to get on like the last maybe 10 or 15 minutes here is the civil rights era. The things that you guys have probably been through but really um, 
you know, you, we got to like, you know, go over again uh, for this and just, you know, for the video. And the, the, the main thing is you guys know, which, which I, I, I love that you guys have learned from me. You always will say, think to yourself, well, Mr. Price and his big fat head always heart upon us that civil rights does not begin with Rosa Parks. Civil rights begins really after the Civil War and working for those civil rights. It really, you know, takes, a, you know, some leaps ahead with the 14th and 15th Amendments. It takes a great leap backwards, probably the low point for civil rights is after Reconstruction in 1877, really up until the 1920s for the most part with the kind of, you know, the people are kind of really fighting back. You got the NAACP's membership increase and in participation of African Americans in World War I. Um, you have, uh, you know, uh, the New Negro Movement. You have like sports stars like Jack Johnson. You have the Universal Negro Improvement Association forming in New York City. Marcus Garvey here. And this black, kind of early black pride movement, even though they did not use that term. That's something that's going to be used a lot in the 1960s that's coming up here. So you really see that really rising uh, with the new Negro movement. Jazz and, you know, again, musicians being respected. And with the kind of, again, growing appreciation, growing recognition of artists, writers, sculptors, playwrights during the kind of so-called labels Harlem Renaissance times of the 20s. So you really see all that working and you see NAACP is really working of course and as we know uh, civil rights takes another you know you're talking about like turning up the levels another level is turned up after World War II people are saying you're fighting the, the, uh, Hitler and the Nazis and all that they want to like you know one Aryan race to control the world well you know the Russians are always pointing at us that we're so hypocrites because we're kind of Hitler like in a way because we have segregation uh, the racism the discrimination that you go along here based upon our minorities in this country and, and a lot of people were saying like yeah you know they're right and we need to like do something about that and uh, for whatever reason, even you know, so uh, again, this is why why a lot of Republicans will get get on board for civil rights, and um, you know, and they actually spearhead because we know the Democratic Party is really split between Northern, Western, and Southern Democrats, and the Southern Democrats are very, very conservative, very, very pro segregationist, a la Strom Thurmond and Dixiecrats, and that nature. So you've already known that. So. You, you get Jackie Robinson in the gray, 1947. It's very public like that, you know. People love to stereotype how, you know, anybody from any race or any ethnicity is going to be like that, you know. And they were, you know, and they, Jackie Robinson was the most popular sport in the country at the time. Dignified, talented, performed. You know, and he really proved himself. One thing about uh, that will, that people probably will not understand unless you are a minority in some type of way, whether it be gender, religion, race, or nationality, you're always proving yourself. And people don't understand when people say, what do you mean I'm privileged? Well, if you're not probably in a minority and you get and you have a lot of negative stereotypes, you're always proving yourself. You're always like, oh. Oh, your son's a doctor. Oh, you showed up on time at work. Oh, you know, you are smart. Oh, like again, so you do like classical music. You're always trying to prove yourself, trying to like, you know, um, go against the expectations of what people think about you. So it, it's always a proven ground in a way. So, and, and people do not understand. People make assumptions. Instead of people making assumptions, I try to, you know, tell people, hey, I assume you're innocent. I assume you're a good person. I assume that you're smart. I assume you're qualified for this job. I assume you should be at this, you know, high, like, you know, flying school here. 
that usually comes to certain people who make assumptions. You know, most other people have to go through like, hey, you know, if Mr. Price is going to Syracuse University. Well, that's affirmative action. It's somebody that like, you know, again, you got to break. Like I say, again, you know, they probably didn't look at my test scores. They're like, oh, well, he's a minority. And, you know, comes from a, you know, impoverished home and everything. And they just walk through the door. And you always have to like, you know, you know, keep your GPA better than somebody, better than the other engineers behind you because of people's assumptions. And it, it really to show the people are talking about, we we're just talking about Japanese in terms. I'm sorry, a little bit offshoot from the civil rights. Don't worry, I'm, I'm getting into that, and I apologize for that. I know you guys, I don't know who's lasted this long. Oh my God. I, but, you know, you think about people, Mr. Price, I can't believe they locked up Japanese, like, you know, during World War II, and especially Japanese Americans. Well, as you can see here around the world, Right now, a lot of people of, of Asian nationality is really suffering some type of like, you know, discrimination to a certain level, a certain type of boycotting of businesses and restaurants, just because we have ignorance really permeating through people's minds. And that they can't separate that, you know, somebody who may be in this country all their life or maybe you've known for all your life or a restaurant that you've gone to frequently, it's not the carriers of COVID-19. And that's not one way you avoid it is avoid certain people. Now, maybe to avoid people who have traveled, but not avoid people who've like, you know, a certain nationality, a certain religion, a certain, you know, again, look, or a certain business for sure. I, I, it's really, even at the beginning of this kind of outbreak and everything, um, the, a lot of people of Asian descent and their restaurants or their businesses that slowed. I, it kind of shows you the ignorance that kind of uh, permeates through this country and throughout the world about uh, how bad it can get, you know. And people want to label a virus <laughs> that's funny, the Wuhan virus, or you know, it sounds like Wu Tang almost. I, I kind of, <laughs> I don't want to like denigrate Wu Tang, to like the Wu Tang Clan, but it almost sounds like you know. I, I mean, you know, to, to kind of stigmatize like that. And I think this is more where people should come together and say the viruses are not like, hey, look, I'm just looking for some healthy cells to latch on to. We're just trying to, like, live and react and everything. I don't care about borders. I don't care about nationalities. If I get an opportunity, we will. I, 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 and then people come together and kind of combat this thing instead of trying to stigmatize the viruses like you know on certain people or certain countries I, I that's just my communist thought for the day all right I, my apologies to all my wacky radical ideas and thoughts i am i apologize to all you like in here anyway so you're getting to the 50s, and there's some Supreme Court cases there that started to, even in the 1940s, that you cannot have white-only primaries. You cannot have a, you know, segregated law schools and colleges in here. You don't have to remember these cases. But the one case I told you that you've learned since first grade, and you should learn the year, and you should learn the, what the case is coupled with. Most of you know it. I would say probably all of you. For the most part, no, but make sure you have it down. Of course, you already know what I'm you know, going to say. 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. Now, things that you should really kind of come from that case, though, is a few details from that case here. Uh, the Really, the one of the main lawyers arguing for, you know, Linda Brown and others is a class action kind of like lawsuit. Linda Brown was in what Brown is like in you know, alphabetical order. That's why she is known as Brown versus the Board of Education. But this is from kids from Virginia, kids all over, kind of like, you know, several states arguing for just that separate, it's not equal. Right? Brown versus the Board of Education is the lawyer, Thurgood Marshall. Uh, a guy that is a protege of 
Charles Hamilton Houston. You don't have to know him. Please, don't, I mean, don't take three seconds to, you know, type up his name or put in there. He's not an all-star African-American, but he's the one that inspired Thurgood Marshall and other lawyers to fight segregation through the courts, through the law. Make it illegal to have segregation. Make it illegal for discrimination. Not only in the kind of schools, but in the workplace, in housing. He's the one coming from Howard University uh, in Washington, D.C., that got on, he, said he saw the kind of potential in Thurgood Marshall in there and saying that, like, you know, what. Well, okay, I'm kind of back. I don't know if you noticed the. Uh, that you, I don't know, I'm going to edit this and put this together a little bit, just kind of like because uh, the camera records to a certain time and then it just automatically like turns off. And I guess, or maybe the camera just got tired of me talking and just, hey, you know what, you've had enough. But I didn't get to finish about the civil rights going on under Eisenhower. Then I know it's like, dang man, HDMI is like, I was like, I'm gonna be like repainting the house. Like, I don't know, this, oh, it's, boy. You know, uh, this summer, maybe you're doing the kitchen. There is nothing I can, there's no magic eraser for this. So I feel like I'm gonna have some chores for this summer. Uh, I think I was trying to say like, what, what, I mean, why are we like, you know, where did that stuff come up on the drywall? I think it's because we have our way we have our couches placed here because we used to prevent our one of our big dogs from like coming into the bedroom. But we kept on rubbing against the wall. It's neither here or there. I know you could care less. Uh, I think I'm definitely recording here. So I that so um so. What I would like to do is just go ahead and finish up with the civil rights at the time here in the Eisenhower. I was going through a whole lot of thing here about with, uh, what was going on with Thurgood Marshall. He's such a prime time player in there. And really the Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren. And Earl Warren was a former governor of California and he is appointed by Eisenhower. And Eisenhower is a Republican. And the Eisenhower think Earl Warren is a good conservative guy. And for the most part, he is. And his governing record in California was pretty much, you know, conservative. I mean, uh, he's, you know, during the war, I mean, like that, you know, Japanese internment. He went along with that. There's nothing to show that he is going to be, you know, make decisions that would seem very progressive or very liberal. Well, he does. And the Warren Court is going to be known kind of like the Marshall Court, you know, who kind of kept federalism in, as a very progressive, liberal, left-wing kind of court in their decision-making. You're going to see this. You see this with Brown. You're going to see this with multiple cases in the 60s. Gideon versus Wainwright, Tinker versus Des Moines, uh, Miranda versus Arizona. Those things that you will see in here. You need to know the Warren Court if we have our A push test anyway, and it's labeled like that. So uh, that that it and it knowing certain chief justices that we really kind of have to know for the A push curriculum in here. And is there a Warren Court? Thurgood Marshall is going to be appointed to the Supreme Court by Lyndon Johnson. And, in 1967, I believe, here, the first African-American Supreme Court Justice. Uh, you're talking about making headways. All right, guys. Once again, I'll continue on here. So uh, you got Brown versus Board. And plus, in the decision, you know, they, it was a 9-0 decision. It was unanimous to try to make some kind of emphatic united front that segregation in public schools must end. And he even said it must that separate was not equal and that everything has to, it just has to be done um, in, in kind of like in a follow-up kind of like you know like you know uh, in the decision process making a brown versus boy he said something like with all deliberate speed meaning let's do we have to do this expeditionally and quickly and as you know the southern states are like you know what you're right you know what we really need to stop this segregating by race it dehumanizes people uh, it definitely is not equal. It definitely is like, you know, they have inadequate facilities, especially in our public education. So we need to like integrate immediately. 
Yeah. So, and this is one of the things you're talking about the lost cause of post Civil War that the Southerners in defiance will be raising, like, you know, the Confederate, Virginia Confederate battle flag, uh, you know, in defiance that you see, like, the, the kind of stars and bars things that you see today that's kind of like controversial. And, and some, to some people, it's controversial. Other people are like, what's wrong? It's just a flag. Um, that it really is a, you know, again, kind of like a united front. It's kind of like the southern resistance into, you know, to integration. It's going to really take the next 20 years to really, you know, get some kind of like forceful kind of uh, in integration here. And in another ironic way, it really takes like Nixon and appointing like a bipartisan commission to really get some things done here to make sure that all schools are like you know fully integrated on that note 1957 just kind of jumping ahead over a little bit of Rosa Parks Emmett Till Martin Luther King a little bit here that you do have the governor of Arkansas kind of becoming this uh, symbolism of resistance to integration when the you know people from you know the black you know uh, high school was going to integrate Little Rock Arkansas's uh, uh, white high school and you need it you know um, there was a lot of resistance and protest when they were going to you know send nine students were going to start in the fall of that year people were going to stand outside they tried to get in they could not get in they was you know again they were taunted you know uh, you, the very famous picture of Elizabeth Eckford and you know being yelled at and she spat upon and um, you know, she, she wasn't, all of them were not that way because she kind of went separate and everything, so, uh, to enter the school. And not all the people were against this kind of integration there. It's not like all the students are outside protesting against the Little Rock Knights. There's a lot of citizens, a lot of people who do not have kids that go to Little Rock, but there's some that are due, that are, but really protesting, yelling and shouting and screaming. Now, I would have to say the majority in Little Rock, Arkansas, the whites is probably against this, so I'm not trying to, you know, uh, again, saying, you know, they're all, like, you know, progressively thinking that they should integrate. Not at all. Not at all. And Eisenhower sees how Governor Faubus, that's his name, uh, that he's, re you know, has the National Guard preventing from Ernest Green and Elizabeth Eckford, you know, from... And 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 uh, seven others from getting into the high school, that he's Eisenhower's not progressive. He's not it, but he knows about what presidents and executives, chief executives do. They enforce the law. They do not make the law. A lot of times, I've misstated and missaid about you know they passed the you know. Fort Lee McCumber like tariff or you know presidents you know uh, make got this you know legislation like you know made they really don't do that they just sign stuff in the law and enforce the law it's Congress who makes the law and so he says if we need I'm going to send federal troops there and I'm going to take over the National Guard and it is a very 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 monumental decision I give Ike a lot of credit for that because I know knowing about reading about the man and you know by his life story coming from Kansas he is not someone a commie like Mr. Price you know who you know who considers himself like you know open-minded and again I'm in the year 2020 thinking here that hey you know you should go ahead and this is the right thing to do he thinks about just enforcing the law opposite of Andrew Jackson when Justice Marshall says that like you know Georgia cannot make the Indians you know move out you know the state it's the opposite that he is going to enforce this decision and it really uh, is a big statement here and so the Little Rock Nine integration there 1957 that's probably something you do not know as much as the court case you probably definitely seen the pictures because it's the time you know that you know, television is prominent, and you have video since first grade, and you see, you know, from from the kind of protest in Selma, Alabama, 
you know, when they're turning on the water hoses that you see all the pictures of the dogs barking. They show them so many times and everything in, in the reels. But this is time for the set that you see Elizabeth Eckford. You see her, you know, in the, those traditional dress trying to get in. And the resistance there and the troops. And Eisenhower making his decision. Please remember that. Uh, Ernest Green graduates and gets a scholarship at the uh, University of Michigan. Martin Luther King is at his graduation ceremony. Just want to say that. You know, when we study history and television and movies, it is really, time condenses down to nothing. Ernest Green and all his classmates went through a lot of heck in their classes, you know, from the teachers, from the students. And he got death threats on his graduation. You know, he says, look, you know, you go up there, you get your diploma, you know, you're going to be dead. I mean, it's just, you know, courageous that, you know, that he went up there. Martin Luther King is there at his graduation ceremony. And that, that is something big for him and his family. And you only really have one group of hands clapping for Ernest Green getting his diploma uh, that year. Because he came in as a senior for 1958, and that was his family. So... Heroes that you don't think of, that guy is uh, Ernest Green, and the people that you know, not ones that you know, really talked about a lot, you know, way. So, um, Daisy Bates working so hard, you know, again, at the local NAACP to get those kids in the green. I'm sorry I mentioned these different people and stuff that you kind of, uh, you know, think about and everything, but uh, there's just a lot of unheard people here that, you know, Especially with the Montgomery bus boycott too that that's going on that should be kind of lauded. Anyway, I guess I'm, I'm taking too much time once again because I need to get to all the other events. You got uh, you know the lynching of Emmett Till people, th and again we think of lynching as hanging. You know that guy, whether he winked, whether he nodded, you know, you know he's from Chicago, he's down in Mississippi too. You know, to to that white girl, it doesn't really matter. We know the aftermath that he is beaten to a pulp, he is shot in the head, he is bludgeoned to death. That is a lynching, all right. So, and you know, and none, nothing happens to the ones that are accused like that. You know, nobody is you know put in jail for this you know murder of Emmett Till, and it really is you know uh, attention grabbing for the nation. Uh, black magazines like, you know, um, Jet and Ebony are like, you know, publishing like, you know, pictures from, you know, his his open casket and everything. So, uh, again, it's one of those things here. Now, later on that year in December, again, you got Rosa Parks and you know the story, you know, for the most part. And again, that Doctor Who episode will go through that, even if I know it's corny as it is. So, but it does a good retracing of that because I think sometimes you kind of miss some points in that. And yes, and she wasn't the first one. Uh, this is Claudette Colvin was the other one, but she's a, Claudette Colvin was a little bit more loud. Let me for when you're doing these things. I know people say like I don't understand people being passive, being dignified. Well, look what happened to Emmett Till. Um. Look what happened to a lot of people who were like, you know, assaulted, beaten up, uh, girls raped, and nothing happens to their, you know, the ones who did these crimes. So you had to tread lightly. Star Star Montgomery bus boycott. I think I don't know there's too much details about that. Just know that like, you know, starts in the December of that year, fifty five and really ends that next year in 56 and about a year over a Supreme Court decision. Buses are integrated and this really makes the kind of star Martin Luther King and you know in here and using kind of this like you know boycotting civil disobedience a la Gandhi a la David Thoreau you know to kind of defy unjust laws. So you have that. So that's Civil Rights Act. I, I mean the uh, Montgomery bus boycott in there. And I said that there's two civil rights uh, commissions slash acts, 5760. They don't, what we call it's a lot of bark, but no bite. So, but, but you get the, you get 
Martin Luther King forming the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in here. So, and there are organizations that's going to be, you know, based around like, you know, kind of origins from the churches and using civil disobedience, passive resistance to try to break the South from segregating against African Americans. Um, yeah, so you see this at this time. And the, and the next big thing, I think, really, and I'm not going to get into all the 60s one on timeline because I'm going to kind of cut this at this time. And I, I don't know who's last. And, and, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, to this point, I, if, if you did, you know, bravo to you. You, get, you guys are amazing kids regardless who's listening or who's not listening. So, but the, uh, again, the Greensboro sit in, you get really people like Ella Baker working from the colleges saying that students need to become activist students, especially these students from these black colleges. Uh, in, um, you know, whether it be uh, Shaw University, whether it be from, uh, you know, a and in Greensboro. And they go down there and they just sit and waiting to be served. Now, I'm telling you, at Woolworths, and that's what it was dying. But back in the day, the diners, um, that's that were your restaurants for the most part. You didn't have the, all the chains and things of that nature. So and that's where you would go get a burger or a sandwich or something and, and get a meal. And and so they just wait in there in there and then you know it, they got a lot of publicity. Police is called. It's really a very peaceful protest on both sides. You don't really see the owner the manager really like you know you don't see, like like in other places that you see a video of uh, being milk and stuff poured upon them call names whispering in their ear saying that you know making threats to them it, it really in a way i'm not trying to say it's a kumbaya moment and like you know they it was no sweat you should give to the greensboro 40 you know it was no big deal but i'm just saying that i i it really kind of works out because really the manager in the own store is like saying hey so you're going to pay us so you can eat in here well i kind of like the color of green so it why not like you know be open to all customers and it really kind of uh, again it's kind of one of the biggest successes of the city movements in here other places like in Tennessee, uh, Sarah Dash and other people of that nature are going to have a more challenging time across the U.S. And this is not the first sit-in. Let me make that clear, all right? And before, you know, there's a lot of people on the civil rights here, um, from Ida Wells to other people uh, who started her sit-ins in Washington, D.C. in the 1930s. So there, there, there is just, this is not the first sit-in, all right? It was the most publicized sit-in uh, that, that we have here is the Greensboro uh, Four there in, in 1960. It's the most publicized. I mean, just man, I always want to clear up to get the true history of that nature here and, and, and what you, you know, uh, make sure that you understand that. Very monumental moment, though, that's the most publicized because you see the momentum is increasing. They're going to start getting onto the Greyhound buses, all right, to lights again with the Freedom Rides. They're going to start with voting, Freedom Summer in 1964, to get more of these kind of rights. And you get the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, I will repeat. So you see the momentum. You need to know this little kind of like timeline and kind of what's going on here. Uh, organizations that are working together, the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE. SCLC, the Student Nonviolent Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, started by Ella Baker, kind of like Stokely Carmichael and others. Will uh, it's mostly kind of a young people's African American leadership, kind of like taking over that. You need to know all this. And don't worry, 